Good afternoon, New City. We're so glad that you're here. If you would please stand. Our God is good and he is good all the time. So we are going to worship the Lord together. Here we go. Let's sing this together. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. so good. Amen. And we're going to sing this next song called How Great Thou Art.
comforting to know that our God is so good and he is always there for us. How great and powerful his name is. That even when things are happening in our lives and things are unsure and times are hard, we can still say that it is well with our soul. Amen. Amen. Let's sing when peace like a river. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast done.
church that it is well, that he can calm the storm and the seas and the winds and the rains, and he is here right now. Amen. Let's take a silent moment to rest your soul in King Jesus and his love for you. Father, as we gather here, we thank you for the, the promise that you made to never leave us or forsake us. The promise that there is nothing that can separate us from your love. Father, we pray for your presence here tonight. Uh, we want to hear from you. And uh, we pray for Chad, who will be bringing your word to us. And ask God that you would be with him provide him the peace that he needs. May he be filled with your spirit. As we hear from him, may we be hearing your words. May our hearts and our ears be open and receptive to whatever message you have for us. With so many people here and so many people watching, and even during the course of the week and the month, people will, will tune in and, and hear this message. Father, we just ask, would protect it and that it would change lives. We would be men and women who would walk out of this building tonight different than the way we walked in. We sing this song, It Is Well With Our Soul, and we sing of the hope we have of the future. And as we prepare our hearts for Chad's message, Lord, just prepare us to receive that we don't have to be a people without hope. You meet us where we're at here and you've prepared a place for us in the future. There are better days ahead. And so we thank you for these promises. And we pray, God, that we could rest in them right now. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you may be seated. And thanks for joining us this evening. New City Fellowship, we are a church that's uh, God's blended family and a church that's looking to see a greater worship of Jesus in our lives, in this church, in our community, and so thankful for your presence here tonight. Want to just let you know a few things that are going on. One of those things has already gone on. We've been talking about it for a few weeks, but it happened last night with our ladies here at the church, met for an evening uh, at Bole, a little dinner down the street, and see some pictures, hopefully, behind me. Is there some pictures? There are some pictures behind me. All right, and there's our little team that got together last night, and my wife was one of those people, and she came home saying it was a great evening just to be together, uh, have a, a nice meal, but mostly it's the community, and that's one of the things that we're trying to constantly just pour into. We understand that, like, this idea of doing faith, doing Christianity, cannot be done on our own, right? We will fail, no doubt. I can attest to it. I tried it out. It doesn't work, right? And so I need people in my life. I need each and every one of you in my life to say, hey, you look like you're going the wrong direction. Let me help you back over this direction, right? And that may sound a little bit weird in a, in a, in a world that maybe favors um, individuality, but this is not what this is about. This is about community and about the reality of our being honest with one another and saying, I need help. I need support. And so this is one of those ways we're doing it. We did it a couple weeks ago with the men at breakfast. We're doing it uh, every day of the week uh, with Psalms in the summer and trying to connect in a simple way like that. We would love to be able to connect with you if you're not already connected. And one of the ways you can do that is by filling out that connect card. They're in the back on your way in or out, uh, or you could do it online and just let us know that you are here and how we can be praying for you and how you can get involved in the life of our church. We have a little video because uh, our pastor isn't here, as many of you know. Uh, but hey, everybody, I'm pastor. going to talk to you now, and I'm going to stop. <laughs> 
Hey everybody, I'm Pastor John, the lead pastor here at New City Fellowship. I've been on vacation getting some time with my family and some rest, and I'm excited to be back with you next Sunday evening. Tonight though, Chad Vertanen is going to close out our series on the Apostles' Creed, focusing on the very last line of the Creed, which says, I believe in the life everlasting. Now, Chad has been a pastor and is a professor of religion at Broward College, so I'm really excited that you'll get to hear from him tonight. Next Sunday, we'll be starting a brand new series called That They May Be One, Relationships, Marriage, Sex, and Worship. Now, when it comes to these things, people have so many questions. How do I know if I'm ready to get married? What is sex for? But there are also questions underneath those questions about relating to one another as human beings. Questions like, why is intimacy and openness so difficult just between two people? What do I do about all this relational baggage? We'll explore those questions and more over four Sunday evenings in August. But this series also has some bonus events. We'll have two after-service discussions to talk about relating to one another with integrity and forgiveness. We're going to have a dinner get-together for the singles in our church, as well as a one-day marriage seminar with another church. You can find all this information on our website, www.newcityhh.com, under our current sermon series button. Now, if you want to stay in the loop, take a moment to text the phrase New City HH to the number 97000. That'll keep you in the loop about things going on and give you opportunities to interact with content in this series. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday evening. All right. Looks like somebody got a tan, huh? I was looking a little bit toastier than the last time I saw him. Well, we're going to dismiss our kids. And uh, kids, I think you have got it figured out if we make our way straight down the path. And there's some folks at the end of the doorway that will direct you. For the rest of us, sticking around. Just say hello to your neighbors around you. Greet each other in Christian love. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing this afternoon? Doing all right? This is actually the first time I've ever been up here, so it looks quite a bit different. All right. Good to go. All right. It is good to be with you all this afternoon. Um, as John introduced, my name is Chad. And some of you guys I'm just starting to get to know, others I know pretty well. Uh, but I've been here for a while, um, and I was formerly a pastor in another life. Um, but it's been a while since I've preached, like maybe three years, four years before the pandemic. So it's been a little while, but um, I'm glad to be here today um, to do this. So, um, yeah, so we're preaching on the Apostles' Creed, but I want to open up with... The last two weeks. Um, so two weeks ago, I was uh, on a family vacation in Riviera Beach. And it was good. It was definitely much needed. So 2023 felt like it's like hit us like a ton of bricks. I don't know if you guys feel that. Do you feel that? I felt that. And it's only July. And so we went on a family vacation to Riviera Beach, um, but not just any family vacation because my wife is Cuban. So we went with her side of the family, which is about 15 to 20 people on any given uh, time. And so it was really lovely because this is like one of the first times we get away for a couple days with family, uh, with my kids. And if you haven't seen my kids, they're the ones like the, the rock band that's up here, you know, running back and forth during worship. But in any case, they're with, we're with family. My kids are there, but we can drop our kids off with, you know, my, my in-laws and go away and walk the beach. And it was just so wonderful to kind of get just a few hours alone with my wife. Um, but the last day is what I want to highlight. So the last full day we were there, um, we left on Friday, we came back on Tuesday. So Friday, oh, we kind of come in, um, and the last full day is Monday. So we're there on Monday, and I'm there on the beach, it's the afternoon, and uh, Riviera Beach is interesting, at least the spot that we were at. There was like a pumping station, uh, maybe a few couple hundred yards off, where they were pumping sand, and so you kind of get to the shoreline, and then you take about five feet, and then it plunges 20 feet down. 
And so it was really interesting because you kind of get into deep water rather quickly. And that wasn't where the resort was, but again, 100 yards off. And so um, my wife's cousin, who just turned 18, um, tells us from the pumping station, because he's like climbing it and it says you can't climb, like no climbing, but he can't read at 18, so he goes and climbs it. Um, and so he says like there's a few manatees a, a few uh, yards off and they're coming towards the shore. And so I'm like, this is my opportunity. Grab some goggles, jump in the water. And it was just amazing to kind of see like these two huge manatees just come towards you and to touch them. And yeah, I touched them. And as they're swimming and they're like nibbling on this grass that's hanging on the metal that's on this uh, pumping station. And I remember getting back to shore and we were with, with them for a while just thinking like, man, like this, this is what I needed. Like all three days leading up to this was great, but now I can go home. This is great. Um, but no, I mean, really, when you get to a vacation like that, it was much needed. You, you kind of get to this place where, man, can we just have one more day? Like, can't this just be a little bit longer? Am I the only one? You, you guys feel that? Um, and so what was in me, this kind of reflection, this kind of like longing, I was trying to find a word for it. I was like, man, like I'm really feeling this tug. Like I want to stay here. I want to be in this moment forever. There's a word I came across a couple years ago that highlights that beautifully. But it's not an English word because in English you don't have all the words that you can use to express all of that. It's a German word and it's called sensat. It's a weird kind of word, sensat. And it means like this deep, inconsolable longing or desire. It's like a yearning you have for something more that you can't quite grasp in that moment. And so it's a yearning. And so I realized at that moment there on the beach that that yearning was meant to point us to something more, meant to point me to something more. And so C.S. Lewis writes this in his book, The Weight of Glory. The books or the music, or in my case, vacation, in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust in them. It was not in them, it only came through them, and what came through them was longing, this idea of sin sucked. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire, but if we are mistaken, but if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not yet found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have, not, we have never visited. And today what we're going to look at is life everlasting. And that longing, that yearning, what the Christian life teaches is that that is what we're all yearning for. Something that nothing in this life can, can truly grasp. Nothing in this life can truly satisfy it's this idea of the life everlasting. And so we have it in the creed in the last part. Um, I'm just going to read the last bit. But it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the life of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So with that, let me pray and we'll, we'll get into it. Jesus, I just pray that you would fill the next couple minutes um, with the message that you want to go out to everybody. Uh, I pray that you would prepare all of our hearts um, to hear and to respond. Um, Jesus, I ask that you would do a work in me to be able to get these words out. And Lord, I pray that through all of this, you would be glorified. And we ask this in your name. Amen. So this idea of everlasting life, uh, it's also in the Bible. We can call it eternal life, uh, the kingdom of heaven, um, the hope of glory kind of goes under all of that. But in Christian teaching, everlasting life is the goal of the Christian life. That's the purpose. That's the point. Um, John 3.16, um, as we have often heard and kind of remember it, for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And so the goal of his love was this unity, this union between men, women, and himself, that he would bring us together. See, we're separated by God because of our sin, and we're at war 
our minds and our hearts with God's will and his desires. I want to do this, but God desires it to be done this way. I, I, I have this in mind, but God has his path. And so then the goal is to be welcomed into that union, into that relationship. But it's Jesus that provides us the way back to God. And so I think about the life of Jesus, and right before his crucifixion, his disciples are asking Jesus um, about these types of things. He's been speaking in code for some time, and the disciples are wanting more clarity. Like, Jesus, like, what are you really trying to get at? So the night that he's betrayed, the day before he's to go to the cross, he's kind of sharing and downloading to them everything that he wants them to know before he departs. And so he says this in John 14. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So, They'll be together again, as Jesus says, in my Father's house. And so it points to this idea of a destination or a place. And so we think of everlasting life as a place that we are going. The goal of our Christian life, to be in this place. And so that means that this is not our home. The ultimate home is to be with God where he is. And so I think about the way the Bible describes us here. The Bible describes us as exiles, as foreigners, as people that are not of this world. And I don't know about you, but I feel this more today than ever as a Christian, that it just feels so much harder. Like it feels so hard in the year 2023 to live out this Christian life way harder than it was when I first believed. Whether it's politicization or whether it's the news media or whether it's the way the outside world views us as Christians, it just makes it super difficult. And yet, when I read the Bible from beginning to end, I think about the children of Israel, I think about the prophets, they were a fun bunch. Uh, I think about the disciples, I think about the people after Jesus, the early church. And Hebrews 11 has something to say about them. But they, those foreigners, saw them, the promises of God, from a distance. So they saw the promises of God from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And so Jesus is preparing a mansion for us or a place for us. Is it a mansion? I don't know. While I was preparing for this, I was thinking about this room and I was thinking about this trim and these moldings. And I was thinking about all this crown work and the miters. And I was like, man, this is awesome. Like this room is awesome. And is heaven going to be anything like that? I don't know. But I, I think the thing to kind of focus in on is that wherever Jesus is, that's where we'll be. We will be where Jesus is. You get to the end of the Bible in Revelation 21. And the writer John says this, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people's, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. That's a beautiful picture. That everything that we as Christians have been yearning for, striving for, faithfully living our Christian life for, our home will be with God. That he will dwell with us and we with him. So as C.S. Lewis says, we cannot confuse those things that point to beauty with God himself. But also, at the same time, we can't confuse this with our home, right? He goes on to say, C.S. Lewis, 
Almost our whole education has been directed to silencing this shy, persistent inner voice. Almost all modern philosophies have been devised to convince us that the good of man is to be found on this earth. And I think about it, and I think about, man, how much I've been influenced by social media and just advertisements, marketing, whatever have you. And it really does seem like everybody who is not of faith is trying to set it up like this earth is all that there is, that this is heaven on earth, especially here in America where everything is consumer driven. It really does feel like, man, is there anything after this? If this is as good as it gets. But in truth, as Christians, we have to understand it's not. I remember the New York Times, um, every couple years they come out with the next 15 ideas that is going to um, uh, influence the next 15, uh, the next the 15 years that's going to uh, be influenced by these 15 ideas. And one of them, this was like maybe in 2015, was this idea of amortality, right? Amortality, the, the idea that we don't ever die. And so we had just come back, this is like maybe 10 years ago, but I don't know if you heard like 40 is the new 30 and 50 is the new 40 and all of that stuff. And I think about all the health and beauty products that we kind of have. Um, you know, I try to moisturize every day just to keep my skin looking young, right? But in truth, whether you're 50 or 40 or 30, you're going to die, right? And it almost feels as though we as a people have been in, been in this denial of death, the fact that we're all going to die. And I think part of that is because we don't know, or the outside world doesn't know and doesn't believe in anything beyond that. And so this might as well, for people that don't follow Jesus, this might as well be heaven on earth. But we know, as Christians, as people of faith, that there is something more beyond that. And it points to another thing, that everlasting life is the answer for all of our longings. If we think about God's love uh, and the goal of God's love is uniting our hearts to his, then it means that without God, there's this God-shaped vacuum um, that every human heart has. Or to put it in the words of Augustine, it means that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God alone. And so we have to think about everlasting life in these ways. Not as though it's a place or a destination that is like Disney on steroids, right? Eternal life is also a reality that the believer lives in, right? It's a reality that you live in. Just like if you're a celebrity, you live in that reality. If you're a person of color, you live in that reality. As children of God, we live in this reality, but in that reality also is this hope of eternal life, right? And so I've just kind of described it as a place, it's a reality, but, but what is it, right? Like, explain it to me. What is this life everlasting? Well, well John 17.3 Jesus is talking with his disciples, and he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ, right? That, that we may know God and the one whom he has sent, Jesus. So I think back to that sunset on the beach, having just dived with manatees, Right? To know that thing which every sunset, every vacation, every relationship, every memory, every object of beauty points to, but is not in itself that, because it cannot truly satisfy, that is God. And to know God, to know God himself, is the thing that brings the soul satisfaction. But also this, on the other side of not just knowing it's in being known, right? There's this little clause, and I don't have it up there, but Paul is writing in the book of Galatians, and he says to the church that he's writing to, since you know God, comma, or rather having been known by God, this idea of like, since you've come as a church to know God, scratch that. 
you've actually become known by God, that God knows you, right? To be known and accepted by God is something that we all want. We just don't know where we're looking for it. I think of a clip that perfectly encapsulate that, um, that encapsulates this. It's, it's Goofy Movie, Disney's Goofy Movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it, um, but I mean, it's like 25 years old or whatever, but I'm really dating myself, but it was a great movie, and if you haven't seen it, you probably should go see it um, tonight, maybe. Um, anyways, so Goofy's son, Max, um, has his, his heart set on the affection of the beautiful Roxanne. The problem that he has is that he's a goof, and so he's a nobody. And so Roxanne is the one here, and she's the popular one in the school, uh, but she doesn't see him. She'll walk right by and don't even, he does, she doesn't even notice him, right? So to get Roxanne to notice him, Max has to impersonate this pop star, and he does so in the school's last assembly before summer break. And this is his last shot to get her to know that he exists, right? So he takes the stage and he sets up a little song and dance. Um, if it were TikTok back then, it would it would just broke TikTok, right? Um, everyone's eyes, including Roxanne's, are on him until there's like this glitch in this suspension that's holding him up, and he goes spinning. It goes out of control. He's caught by the principal, and he's found to be a fraud in front of the entire assembly, right? And I find this interesting because. I know so many people that feel that in that moment. If you've seen that clip, you know what that feels like, to be found out, to feel that void of wanting to be seen and wanting to be known. And in an era of social media, I think it's just ripe for our generation, ours and Gen Z, that they want to make something of themselves. But recently, there was interesting polls on those that actually hit the scales in terms of viewers and subscribers that their depression level is no different than those that are just the regular, common, ordinary people trying to be seen. That the very thing that they're wanting from their audience, they cannot get. They want to be known. And they want to be accepted. Or you feel, the, you feel this fear of being found out, right? Of being a fraud. The big thing that's in my generation is this idea of imposter syndrome, right? That you'll always be found out, that you're not the real deal, that somebody will come and like just point you out, um, and that you'll be either canceled or that you will be, uh, could be fired or whatever have you. But it's that fear of being fully known and not accepted. When in truth, we all want to be known and accepted, even from young. I see it in my two-year-old all the time, my son Caleb. He'll come to me and he'll say, Daddy, watch this. And he'll take a ball and he'll throw it to the ceiling and he'll try to catch it. When really what he's looking for is my reaction. And I remember the first time he threw it in the air, hit the ceiling, and it hit his hands. He caught it. And he looked to me. And I'm like so ecstatic and I'm clapping for him. I'm saying, you go, son. My wife comes in like, Ellie, did you just see what he just did? And the smile that he gave me from ear to ear was the same picture of somebody wanting to be known and accepted, to be approved that I've got hands because he knows daddy's got some good hands, right? Um, the idea and that joy that comes with acceptance, that's what we long for. So C.S. Lewis goes on, he says, For glory means good rapport with God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement, and welcome into the heart of things. The door which we have been knocking all, all our lives will open at last, to be fully known and fully accepted, with all of our flaws, our, fear, our fears, and our failures. Life everlasting is that door, that we find that we've been knocking on all of our lives. And that's what God invites us into. And because of that, it's for the last reason I'll give this morning, or this afternoon, is the reason for Christian hope. So eternal life is a place and a destination, but it's also a reality that we as Christians live into 
in the here and now, and we do that by having this hope in life everlasting. Again, to go to C.S. Lewis, he says, glory as Christianity teaches me to hope for it turns out to be satisfying my original desire and indeed to reveal an element in that which I had not noticed. So Jesus told his disciples before he went to the cross that I am preparing a place for you. And for us on this side of the cross, that place is already prepared. On the cross, Jesus purchased our spots in God's kingdom. We have a room in God's house, one that Jesus paid the mortgage for. We are fully known and fully accepted by God. And God looks upon us with delight and approval, but it's not because of what we have to offer. It's because of the one who paid the mortgage. It's because of what Jesus has done for us. So what does that mean for us today? I don't know. I, I mean, I look around and I see, man, everything seems like it's getting more expensive, right? It's been like 103 degrees for like five days straight. And it's so hot. It's so sticky, right? We don't even get paid enough to care about what the government is doing anymore. But when I think about what awaits us as Christians, when I think about what the promise is, is for us. In Revelation 21, I'll read it again. Then I heard a loud voice from on the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. To know that there will be no more tears, more, more, no more grief, no more crying, no more pain, no more 104 degree weather, it should be a comfort for us. I remember my daughter the day before, or the day, the last day of our Riviera Beach vacation, we're packing up, me and my wife, and it's a lot of stuff, you know, three kids, it's just a lot of diapers everywhere, like you're just throwing stuff in the bag, we got to go check out us at 11. And I remember my daughter coming to me and just, she was just like so upset. It's like, I don't want to go. I want to stay here forever. And I had to tell her this, baby girl, this is not our home. And I think for us as Christians, we should not make that mistake of thinking we want to be here forever. Because while this life offers great experiences, right? The idea of love, a beautiful sunset, chasing after your dreams and actually achieving them, all of those different types of things, all of them are good, the relationships. We also have to keep in mind all of the grief, all of the despair, right? Right? All of the things that stress us out, that keep us up at night. And yet there's this promise of life everlasting. What difference would it make in our lives if we looked forward to life everlasting the same way we look forward to our next vacation? How much more hopeful would we be day in and day out as Christians? I think about that. As long as we're here, we'll have those tears, grief, crying. Um, but we'll also have the good things, you know, sunsets, Riviera Beach. But it's only to point us to the destination, the reality of being where Jesus is, right? And that is the only thing that will tr truly satisfy the longings of our heart when the door of which we've been knocking our entire lives is finally open. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. Um, as we finish out the Apostles' Creed, I pray that this would be a resounding amen, that we as a church believe in that. 
And so, Lord, I ask that you keep us hopeful. Help us to look up when this world would have us think that this is our only home. Help us to hold out to the promise that there's so much more for us, that our dwelling place is to be with you where you are, and that your home is to be with us. So we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue in worship together. Would you please stand? together worthy is the lamb sing holy 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 is the lord god almighty was and is and is to come with all creation i sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and i will adore you rainbows clothed in rainbows of living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder blessing and honor strength and glory and power be to you the only one Creation, I sing. 
thinking about my deepest longings being satisfied, and I found myself echoing the last lines of the Bible with John saying, yes, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, to have everything made new, to be with him. Man, I long for that. And so thank you, Chad, for bringing that message tonight. And uh, I want to welcome, uh, you know, encourage you to fill out that welcome card or that connect card uh, before you leave. If you haven't already, let us know how we can connect with you. If you'd like to give back to the church, there's opportunities for you to do that. Uh, you can do that online. You can do it on your way out also. So please, uh, if you'd like to, that'd be uh, a blessing to us and, of course, to the community as we try to reach the community with the gospel here. Uh, if you have kids, don't forget to pick them up on your way out. And before we go, reach out your hands and receive the good word of the Lord. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.